Well, good morning. It's good to see all of you this morning. I'm glad you're here. The Lord is glad you're here. If you would, grab your Bible and turn to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. You know this text, don't you? Hear now the word of the true and living God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let us pray. Lord God, we want to honor you as maker and creator. You are the almighty maker of heaven and earth. And Father, as we turn our attention to your word, we pray that you would help us so that having learned who you are and the way that things are, we may be of benefit to others. We may shine the light of the gospel here and elsewhere. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. We begin a new sermon series this morning called Six Questions to Ask a Skeptic. And over the next uh, several weeks, we're going to look at a different question each week that deals with the way things are and why they are the way that they are. I believe we as Christians want to engage our culture, our society. One way to do that is by asking good questions. Sometimes uh, when we get into conversation, we need to ask questions of clarification. What do you mean by that? What do you mean when you say this? And, and that is helpful in providing definitions. And we're going to talk about uh, one, of the, uh, one of the questions that is asked when we ask the question we're going to ask this morning, which is, why is there something rather than nothing? Uh, one question that needs to be addressed in, in working toward a definition is, what do we mean by nothing? And, and we'll, we'll work through that because it's... It's important to work through definitions. If, if we don't work through definitions and, and defining what it is we're talking about, what can end up happening is we talk past one another. Or because they're working with a definition which is different from our definition, we're, we're really not making any progress. And so it's important to make sure that we define what the discussion is. I think a lot of the times what can happen when we get into conversation with people is, uh, and, and even with folks that we're in disagreement uh, on certain things about, is we become defensive. Our defenses go up. And now, instead of seeking truth, we become aggravated, combative, argumentative. But I think one thing that we can do is take a page right out of the book of Jesus. Jesus' book, you know, when He got into religious discussion with the people in his day, you know what he would do? A lot of the times he would ask a question. He, he would ask a question in reply to those who were coming to him. I'm thinking of one example right now where a man came up to Jesus and said, Jesus, tell my brother to divide the inheritance between us. And he says, who made me judge between you two? Judge and arbiter between you two. You would often ask questions in that way. What is the greatest commandment? Someone would ask him. Uh, and, and he would reply with, well, what does the law say? Or, uh, uh, I've kept all these things from my youth. And he would reply uh, sometimes with a question. So, asking a question with a question or answering a question with a question can be helpful. Or in conversation when someone says something, ask a good question back. Uh, that's have the basis for what this is. Six questions to ask a skeptic. Because these questions are going to cover things like existence, things like morality, uh, even, even the way that we're built. Uh, we'll, we'll cover those sorts of things as well. These questions are designed to open up conversation, not close down conversation. You're not going to ask these questions and then just kind of walk off like, ha ha, got them, right? They're designed to engage in non-manipulative dialogue. A lot of times what happens when we get into conversation is it becomes a monologue. 
And, and what we're really trying to do is, is manipulate the conversation so that we win. But that means that they lose, right? Or what can happen is it becomes kind of smarmy. Or we, we, we end up almost coming across as used car salesmen. Like, what do I got to say to get you into Jesus, right? A non-manipulative dialogue, it's a dialogue. It goes back and forth. And, and what we're attempting to do is get the person to think about their worldview, why it is they see the, way that the, the, the world that the way that they do, in order to hopefully help them identify the inconsistencies in their worldview, in the foundations of the worldview, and basically get them to abandon that worldview for a Christian worldview that is rooted in Scripture. We don't want to do that by forcing, by manipulating, anything like that. We want to open up dialogue and get them thinking, pondering these questions. I think these questions are important. I think we have good answers for these. We ought not be afraid of conversation with folks, nor should we be ashamed of the answers. I think what happens a lot of times in conversations that Christians have is we start throwing stuff out because we're looking for common ground or neutral ground. No such thing. We don't ask the unbeliever to do that. They cling desperately to their worldview, their unbelief. Meanwhile, we're over here making concessions like, I guess we can talk, toss this out, or why are we going to argue from the Bible anyway? They don't believe the Bible. You're right, they don't believe the Bible. But we're not, a, we're not telling them, you have to abandon your unbelief in order, to, in order to, to even enter the argument. They're clinging to theirs. Meanwhile, we're pitching stuff out. No, we, we ought to hold on to our uh, uh, ideas, our presuppositions. That's the big word for it. But the things that we take for granted in the world, and we do take things for granted, just like the unbeliever takes things for granted. And, and we're going to work through those things as we go through this. Six questions to ask a skeptic, I guess, again, talking about definitions. What do we mean by skeptic? Well, Barna, George Barna, he wrote a book several years ago uh, called The Seven Faith Tribes. It is somewhat dated. I think there's still some beneficial things in it, but it's dated. Back in 2009, when this book was published, there there. He, one of the faith tribes he identified were the skeptics. And these are the folks that basically say they don't affiliate with any religion. And hence, you know, the, the graphic there. You got Christianity, you got Islam, you got Buddhism. They just, they, they're, they're non-religious. And so they, they toss the whole thing out. And, they are, and so for a long time, the conversation was about the rise of the, the nuns. Those who identify with no religion, they fill out the bubble nun when it comes to what is your religious affiliation none and so for a long time that was the conversation uh, so like i said it's a little dated because back in his day uh, in 2009 i should say his day wasn't too long ago was it i was still just a lowly associate minister at that time 11 percent of the u.s population identified as skeptic well you fast forward and gallup they're still doing this they release polls all the time and this is uh, the information here Maybe a little hard to see, but this is the most recent number here. 21% answers the question, what is your religious preference as none? 21%. So it's increased a bit. What's fascinating is a lot of the conversation these days has to do with, it's kind of plateaued the last few years. It kind of dances between 20 and, and 21, right? And so, um, yeah, a lot of the conversation has to do with the fact that it's not rising like it used to. But it's still there. One-fifth, 20%, 21% of the U.S. population identifies as none. Uh, no religious preference. So these uh, may be your neighbors. They may, may be your coworkers. They may be your friends, your family, uh, your children, your grandchildren. Okay? And so, yeah, what, what are some good questions, some big questions that need to be answered? See, that's the thing. Just because you pitch religion and hold to uh, the, the worldview that says, no, I'm not religious, those big questions are still there. They don't go, they don't go answered now, and all of a sudden I've got a good answer for that. They're still, they, they go unanswered a lot of the times. And so these questions, again, they're designed to dig down and help us think about these things uh, seriously. The, the first question we want to pose is, why is there something rather than nothing? 
spoiler alert, we are believers and we believe that there is something rather than nothing because God created it. The very first verse of the Bible tells us God created everything. The first chapter is the wide focus lens, right? And you get a view of, of all of the universe leaping into existence as God speaks and things happen. Chapter 2, the, the focus comes in a little tighter, and now we're really focused on humanity and the origin of humans, and God took His time, got His hands dirty in creating humans. And then chapter 3, the focus comes in real tight, tight angle lens, as we see why are things the way that they are now? Which is broken, by the way. And so chapter 3 explains the fall. So that's, we believe God made everything. That's why there's something rather than nothing. Of course, again, um, the believer may ask, well, why is God the best explanation? We'll talk about that. But again, working with definitions, we even have to back up here and ask the question, well, what do we mean by nothing? And one thing that may be beneficial is, well, how, how would the unbelieving worldview answer that question of what is nothing? Because we have an idea, right? What is nothing? And we'll flesh that out here in just a moment. What are some of the answers that you get from unbelievers? Well, I ran across a couple of articles uh, here recently uh, about nothing and quantum mechanics, right? Quantum mechanics, that's a, a, a growing field in theoretical physics and things like that. And so here's an article, this was just a couple months ago. Nothing doesn't exist. Instead, what do you have? You have quantum foam, right? Quantum foam, that's, that's the, the, the explanation for uh, the something that we have here. Okay? And so, uh, this can get very detailed, but basically, when you get down at the very tiny uh, micro level of existence, things are blinking in and out of existence, and it's because of quantum foam. All right? uh, quantum foam... Uh, makes an interesting appearance in one of Michael Crichton's books, Timeline. I read that in high school, and that line still sticks in my mind uh, that this uh, babbling time traveler came back, and he was talking about a quantum phone made me roam. Well, he's talking about quantum foam. So, weird, the stuff that sticks in our brains, right? Nothing doesn't exist, which is interesting because, well, okay, if nothing exists, um, yeah, except for that foam, that foamy stuff, well, is, are, are you saying that that's the reality right now? Because really, th then, you're not providing an answer for origins. It's not a, a, a satisfying answer concerning where everything came from. Well, then I ran across this here, four fundamental meanings of nothing in science. Ah, science to the rescue, right? Well, and then you get into debate about, well, what exactly is nothing? What are we talking about here? What's fascinating is, as you read this article, is three of the four... There's something. <laughs> uh, whether they require matter, some kind of matter, quantum foam, whether they require like space or laws of physics, that's a big one. You need laws of physics in order for stuff to happen. Um, there's, there's always something in these. The one of the four uh, that they talk about here about absolute nothingness, space, time, laws of physics don't exist, is only a philosophical construct do that which i think is where we would land when it comes to nothing we're talking about prior to there being anything what existed well even for us there would be god right but in terms of our universe there was nothing there was no space no time no laws of physics nothing but but the scientist says well that's just that's a philosophical construct to which i would say i think that's right because of my presupposition is god existed before that but the unbeliever, because of their, preconcept, uh, their, their preconceived ideas and their presuppositions, must assume there was matter or space or laws of physics. Where did those come from? I can give an account for why there is something rather than nothing because I say God made it. You haven't provided me a basis for why you say these things have to exist. Quantum foam. Where'd that come from? No answer. No good answer anyway. Nothing. What do we mean? We're talking about no space, no time, no matter, no laws like gravity, thermodynamics, physics, right? All that stuff came into existence. Why? No good answer. Don't really know. 
and provide maybe some theories, theoretically. Why is there something rather than nothing? Why, where did space come from? Where did time come from? Where, where did all these laws of gravity, physics, and all that come from? We would say God. God made them. God created them. Because He is before all things, and through all things, and in all things. Again, there will still be some questions, perhaps, that we may be asked in reply to saying absolute nothing, right? Well, uh, where does space-time come from without space or time? We may be asked. How, and here's a big one. How do, you, how do you postulate something outside of the universe? Outside of the universe. Uh, how, how do you get that without space? Uh, how do you have a beginning without time? And whence come laws of physics? Where do those come from? Again, these are questions you may be asked in reply to your philosophical construct of absolute nothingness. Well, um, the laws of physics, they came from the great lawgiver, God. Those exist because He's upholding the universe by His Word. And uh, have a beginning, well, in the beginning, there's your time. That's where time began. What about space? Heavens and earth, right? That's, that's, where those, that's where space came into existence. And prior to that, God was the one who existed outside of time and space because He's the eternal God. Time, he's not subject to time like we are. Outside uh, of space. And then, where did space time come from? Well, once you have space and time, because God created them, then you can have space time as you uh, think of it. It's interesting, again, when you continue to dig into what the unbeliever would say. Uh, for example, here is Dr. Lawrence Krauss. He wrote the book on a universe from nothing. Wrote the book on it. So we should expect. Uh, some kind of answer as to, okay, well, how do the uni- how do we get a universe from nothing? And what he says in his book, and by the way, theoretical physicist, he's kind of the been the, the rock star for atheists in recent years. Uh, for a long time, he was right behind Stephen Hawking, but now Stephen Hawking is the late Stephen Hawking, and so he may have frog jumped there. He was he was a professor at ASU uh, when he published this book, but he again here's the argument. Ready? Nothing is unstable. Ready? Nothing will always produce something in quantum mechanics. There you go. Nothing always produces something. Well, that's a, that's a bold assertion, but you have not justified that. You've just stated that. Your presupposition, nothing's unstable, according to my quantum mechanics and, and all that, it's always going to make something. So what happens when theoretical physicists disagree with other theoretical physicists and you get theoretical physicists beef, right? Well, that's enter uh, Dr. David Albert, another theoretical physicist. He's a professor at Columbia University. And when when, when he had beef with Krauss, he called Krauss a moronic philosopher. (laughs) Not exactly Biggie Tupac, but hey. Some of you got that. <laughs> East Coast, West Coast. Anyway, this, uh, he called him a moronic philosopher, and he went on to say, all this, but all this to say about this, all there is to say about this, as far as I can see, is that Krauss is dead wrong, and his religious and philosophical critics are absolutely right. Our brothers over at Apologetics Press also published uh, an article about this uh, shortly after Krauss's book appeared in bookstores, and this was their conclusion. And it's a, uh, I'll, I'll commend it to you to read. It's, uh, it's not light reading, because they do quote from the quantum mechanics and theoretical physicists and all that. But I think I've distilled the main of the argument here, which is, can quantum mechanics create universe from nothing? By the way, I don't know if you noticed that earlier, but Whenever your theoretical physicists, your scientists talk about the universe, it's a capital U. Very interesting, right? Capital U, uh, which I think, again, once, once more demonstrates, betrays the, the, the foundations of why they believe what they believe. Uh, if, if nothing requires there to be something, then I think if you, if you dig down deep enough, the unbelieving worldview would have to say that matter itself is eternal. 
And if not matter, then maybe the laws of physics. Something has to be eternal in that worldview. What it is, you have to dig for. But can quantum mechanics create universes from nothing? No. Right, our brothers at Apologetics Express, quantum particle generation requires pre-existing energy, a far cry from nothing. For us, what kind of energy is in back of the creation of the universe? It's God. It's His power. It's His almighty power that is in back of creating everything. Uh, and so, yeah, God did it. So let's break this down a bit further for us and explore this just a, a bit more. Yeah, that's going to work. Okay, good. I double-checked it beforehand because sometimes PC and Mac don't always play well with each other, and I am a PC guy and our stuff in the back is a Mac. Uh, but anyway, um, we believe that God created everything. He created humans at the beginning. He created this world that we live on. And this world is itself a revelation of God and a revelation of His power. We know this from texts like Romans chapter 1 and verses 19 and 20. For what can be known about God is plain to them, humanity, because God has shown it to them. God has revealed it to them. How? For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they, humans, are without excuse. You are supposed to look around at this creation, and it is a revelation of God, of His power, of His invisible attributes. You're supposed to look around and draw a certain, con certain conclusions. Namely, there is a God. He's immensely powerful. And, uh, and, and He must be good because He lets me uh, live on His planet, even though I know, because I have the law written on my heart, there's the internal evidence, and I've broken His law. I know I've done that. The thing is, everybody does this. This is what's called, we talk about natural theology. You look around. Everybody's a natural theologian. Because you look around and you, you draw certain conclusions. There is a God. What happens is, because we suppress the truth in unrighteousness, is instead of giving credit to the one true and only God, humans, our hearts are idol factories, as one theologian has said, and we begin to worship anything and everything other than the one true and only God. Still without excuse, right? We, we, don't, get to, we don't get to say at the end of time, when we stand before God in judgment, I didn't know. I had no idea. Everything in the world, and then also internally, we have the witness of God's law written on our heart. Romans 2, verse 14 and 15. This is why people who've never seen the inside cover of a Bible still know, shouldn't steal stuff. Still know, shouldn't murder other people. The law written on our hearts. And it's inescapable. And everybody knows it. And so when you look around at the universe... You look around and you see the mountains, tall trees, puppy dogs and kitties, and flowers and everything. All of it is a testimony. All of it is God revealing He exists. But it's not just the world that we see around us that is a revelation of who God is. And in fact, again, general revelation, which is the world that we see around us and the law written in our hearts, that only gets you so far. It can tell you that the God that exists is very great. But it can't tell you of His grace. It can tell you that we've, we've sinned. And we've broken the law of this great lawgiver. It can condemn us, but it can't save us. It reveals that there is a God, but it doesn't tell us that this God exists eternally as three in one. Three persons in one being, eternally. For that, we do need special revelation. We do need God to communicate to us. And we've always had this, by the way. Go back to the garden. 
Here's Adam. He's been created, placed in God's garden with a job to do. He's supposed to work and keep the garden. But he also has a will to obey. How does Adam know that he can eat of any tree in the garden except for the one, the tree of knowledge and good and evil? How does he know that? God spoke to him. God revealed that. There's special revelation. It's always been there. Okay. Um, and then we go throughout uh, uh, history, and we have the, the giving of the law at Sinai. And, and you have the, the whole sacrificial system, and all that, of course, pointing to Jesus, right? You have the Old Testament Scriptures as they are written and, and codified uh, in, and, and kept by the Jewish people. The oracles of God, they were entrusted to the Jewish people. Paul tells us this in Romans chapter 3. And so all along the way, you have uh, the revelation of who the one true and only God is. You have His name, Yahweh. You do have hints and glimpses of the, uh, the existence of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, though you don't get that until Jesus shows up in history. And now we have the incarnation and the revelation that God is Father and God is Son and also God is Holy Spirit in the sending of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And all this, again, is the revelation of God. And that is what is sufficient for us to do theology proper, to think rightly about the God who is and the God who exists. And it's, the, it's, it's through the special revelation of God that we come to learn about the grace of this God. Is God obligated to save any of us rebel sinners? No. And yet He is gracious in sending His Son into the world to die on the cross in our place for our sins. We read about how God has spoken through His Son, through Jesus. Hebrews chapter 1 talks about this. And it's the Son who tells us that we must believe in Him. Otherwise, we will die in our sins. John 8, verse 24. We must repent, otherwise we will perish. Luke chapter three, uh, 13, verses 3 and 5. That we must believe the Gospel and be obedient to the Gospel and be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, to receive the Holy Spirit, all this. Looking at the mountains, looking at the sky, the sun, moon, and stars, you will not get the Gospel from that. I know there have been those who have attempted to find the Gospel in the stars. Only through special revelation are we able to know the Gospel and come to know this God who exists. Well, we're still left with a question. Okay, God, God created everything. Why? Why does, he, why does He create what He created? And there, it's true, there's no treatise in the Bible. You know, I can't tell you to turn to the book of creation and we're going to see how, why God did what He did. But I do believe there is sufficient revelation in God's Word that explains to us why God did what He did. Why He created something rather than just leaving no space or time, nothing, right? Why He determined from all eternity to create what He created and to make what He made. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 48, I want to give you one passage from the Old Testament, one from the New. There are others that could be marshaled, but I think these are sufficient. Two witnesses, as it were, Old Testament, New Testament, to unite to tell us and, and explain to us a bit as to why God did what He did. Isaiah 48 and verse 11. For my own sake, for my own sake, I do it. And granted, there is a specific context to Isaiah chapter 48 as to God's work in this world. But I do believe there is a principle here that can be distilled from these, uh, this revelation from God in Isaiah as to why God acts, why God does what He does. And it's this, it's for my own sake, for His sake, that is. It's for God's own sake. It's according to His good pleasure and His good will that He does what He does. Why He acts the way that He acts. Why He has determined to create rather than not create. It's for His own sake and for His own uh, pleasure. And then Colossians 1 and verse 16. Maybe a little hard to read there. Colossians 1 verse 16 says, and actually let's back up and, and get to verse 15. What's under discussion here is the Son. 
in whom we have redemption. He, Colossians 1.15, He, that is Christ, He is the image of the invisible God, the first creation. Listen carefully. Ready? For by Him all things were created. This demonstrates for us that the act of creation was a Trinitarian activity. That the Father, by or through the Son, with the Holy Spirit, created all that we see around us. Okay? By Him, by the Son, all things were created. In heaven, on earth, everything visible and invisible. Catch that. According to the materialistic worldview of the unbeliever, all that exists is matter. It, it must be something physical in order for it to exist. Paul here is explaining that the Christian worldview says, yeah, there is the physical material universe, but there's also stuff we don't see. Invisible things like thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities. In other words, all the angelic hosts, all the unseen spiritual realm, that exists too. And that came into existence because of Jesus. Here we go. All, why did God create? All things were created through Him and, ready, for Him. That is for Jesus. That God creates what He creates in order to glorify Himself in the Son. That this creation, God made everything because it pleased Him, it was according to His good will, and also, all creation in Christ is intended to glorify and magnify God. And does that mean that uh, everything, all, all, all people, all fallen angelic beings are bent on doing the will of God and glorifying Him in that? No. But we know that sinners going to sin. Fallen angels are going to do everything they can to oppose God and His work. But God's intention is that everything in creation would glorify God. So God, He made everything. And here's where we make the connection with our skeptical friends. You see, God created not just everything impersonally, but He created everything you and me Included personally. You and me, he, he created us. And it's a personal creation with us. You see, while our worldviews may differ, and they do, we must always, what was it one of our brothers used to say back in the day? We need to see souls. We need to recognize that our skeptical friends are, like us, created in the image of God. Granted, sin has marred that image. It hasn't erased it. It's not destroyed and kaput and gone. We still bear that image. That's part of the reason why even people who've never seen the inside cover of a Bible, again, still recognize that there are certain things that are right and certain things that are wrong, and they're always right or they're always wrong. It's because of that divine image within us. We, Christians, have come to the one who can restore and renew that image that we lost because of sin. And we invite our skeptical friends likewise to experience that renewal and that restoration of that marred image in Christ. We have opportunity then to explain that we didn't come from nothing and to nothing we return when, when this universe burns itself out. But rather we came from a good God who desires eternity with us, which is why He sent His Son, Jesus, into the world to die on a cross for our sins. And just as we have found the forgiveness of our sins, our skeptical friends likewise can, if they will bow the knee to King Jesus and be obedient to Him. Oh, our God, He has created us not for nothing, but for something, something glorious, something eternal. And that is eternity with Him in heaven. We were created. Uh, and, and in fact, I could, I could bring uh, my uh, boys up here and they could uh, an answer the, the first question. That's often in a lot of catechisms. 
as to uh, why God created everything. And it, the first question is, what is the chief end of man? That is, what, what is the, the final goal for humans? Well, why did God create us? The chief end of man is to, uh, uh, is to uh, obey God and enjoy Him forever. That's why we were created. It's to enjoy God. And to enjoy life with Him forever. Our, our skeptical friends will voice um, complaint that they lack enough evidence to believe. But as we've seen in, in Romans chapter 1, it's not an evidence problem. It's not an information problem. It's, it's a moral problem. It's a spiritual problem. But it's interesting. Again, they'll, they'll voice complaint that there's not enough evidence. There's, there's not enough proof for their for them to believe or them to have faith. But then, at the same time, they'll turn right around and, and go to great lengths in order to explain how something, indeed everything, came from nothing. And postulate theories about what nothing even means in the first place. But then, even then, the, the whole created universe unites to say what exactly? Well, from a materialist perspective, it doesn't really say anything. It's not the good creation of God that uh, declares His handiwork. It's not the creation of God that declares His glory or shows who He is. And then again, if we came from nothing and likewise we're heading for nothing, then what does that mean about life? about our individual lives. Why many atheistic, unbelieving philosophers have tended toward a nihilistic view of things. If indeed we came from nothing and we're heading for nothing, then life must mean nothing. But for us, uh, number one, that's very unsatisfying. But number two, we have found, I believe, a very satisfying answer. God has always existed, and this universe came into existence because God created it. We're part of that universe. We're the good creation of God. Sin is what has messed everything up, and we find the solution to the sin problem in Jesus. And now, having our sin problem dealt with, walking with God, we journey with Him to eternity to enjoy Him forever. That is why there is something rather than nothing. Let's commit this to prayer. Lord God, we pray for our skeptical friends, our, our unbelieving friends that are in bondage to a worldview and even in bondage to a dominion of darkness. We pray, Father, that You would use our meager efforts to bring the light of the Gospel so that You might bring freedom to our skeptical friends. Indeed, Father, if, if they, like we, believe the Son, He is able to set them free. We believe this, Father. Help us to ask good questions, to in turn then provide good answers that come ultimately from You and from Your Word. We pray all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen.